which is 832 now, and we will start this morning with our chaplain prayer, and I'm going to ask Ed Lopez, uh, police chaplain, to please come forward and lead us in prayer. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you on this beautiful Tuesday morning, thanking you, Father God, for the privilege that we have to open our eyes and serve your kingdom one more day. We come before you at this time, Lord, asking you, Father God, that you be with our honorable mayor, city council members, city manager, and city staff. Oh, Father God, that all the business that will take place today you will give wisdom from above to make the best decisions for our city to go forward. We ask you, Father God, that as your prayer of Jabez says, to enlarge our territories, and we ask you for your blessings upon the businesses of San Angelo. And Lord, just continue to bless every citizen in our fine city. We ask you, Father God, that you place your head to protection around our schools, our children, our job sites, our homes. Be with our first responders, Lord, and protect them. We ask you, Father God, that you just take care of our city, Father God, as it grows, Lord. May, Father God, may we also grow in good deeds. And Father God, right now, we just come before you and we ask you, Lord, now that you lead us and guide us throughout this meeting this morning, that you will, Father, just Open your heart and soul within each and every one that will be taking part in this meeting today. That Lord, Father, all we ask always is for your will to be done. We ask you now, Father God, as your prayer of Jabez says, to bless us, O Lord, and bless the city of San Angelo indeed. Bless it, O Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we have Riley and Brayson Sears from Water Valley Elementary who are in the fifth and third grade to lead us in prayers. Would you come forward and help me do this? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America Great job, Riley and Brace, and thank you for being here. We will now go into proclamations and recognitions. Uh, we had a request to do a proclamation for San Angelo School Choice Week, um, so, but there's no one in the audience, I understand, to accept this proclamation, so I'll just read it quickly, and then we'll go on to the next one. Proclamation of San Angelo School Choice Week. All children in San Angelo should have access to the highest quality education possible. San Angelo recognizes the important role that an effective education plays in preparing all students in San Angelo to be successful adults. Quality education is quick, critically important to the economic vitality of San Angelo. San Angelo is home to a multitude of high quality public and non-public schools from which parents can choose for their children in addition to families who educate their children in the home. School Choice Week is celebrated across the country by millions of students, parents, educators, schools, and organizations to raise awareness of the need for effective educational options. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, 
Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim January 26th through February 1, 2020 as San Angelo School Choice Week in San Angelo, Texas, and call this observance to the attention of all our citizens. Next, we will do a recognition for the city's support towards Goodfellow Air Force Base Altus Award. And Mike Boyd, I think you're here to present it today. Please come forward. Do I have other people here with Mike Boyd? Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you can't hear me? How? The people on, the people the people on TV, on TV can't hear Age you. has a lot to do with it, Harry, I know. Okay. Anyway, good morning. Mike Boyd, a uh, member of the Goodfellow Advisory Group here uh, in San Angelo and also on the, the San Antonio uh, AETC group. And Dr. Bonds is with me, uh, my mentor, my boss. And then Randy Brooks is a newly elected member of AETC out of San Antonio that will represent Goodfellow also. Anyway, we wanted to come forward. You know we've got the partnership between San Angelo, Tom Green County, and, and, and Goodfellow Air Force Base. Uh, to remind you, we've got 37, I call them MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding. They call them partnership agreements. But the key to that is we have more agreements between us than any other base in the United States Air Force, not only in the state of Texas, but in, in the Air Force. Uh, with COSA DC's help, and I know somebody Todd's here from COSA DC and Guy. Y'all have granted us through your approval 2,133,000 just on the last couple of big grants. We've been able to roll that into over 11,771,000 in a state and federal money. Uh, we're in the process of applying for another grant. I think it'll be extremely good. We turn that in on February the 28th of this year. And just to let you know, we're going for a $5 million grant through DAG through the state already. And, Dr. Bonds and her wisdom has written it up and, and it looks really good. Uh, I think it will definitely benefit the city. We're not ready to tell you what all is included, uh, but with the growth that we've had at Goodfellow, you know, we're expecting another 1,500 students next year. Uh, yeah, I know it's great. We're trying to figure out where we're gonna put them, but with Guy's help and some of the local investment groups around town, we've got somewhere between five and seven projects that are gonna mature somewhere in 21 uh, or already part of 22. But the last grant I think is important. You know, we, we built seven classrooms. Uh, we put a, <clears throat> excuse me, included in those secured classrooms, we put a mental health office, uh, something that no one else right now in, in Texas has done, either on the Army or the Air Force side at all, but an opportunity for those spouses, soldiers, sailors, airmen to go in and uh, visit with someone if they need to. So with one of the local hospitals, we've got that worked out where they'll be there to help that. We also increased the dining facility by 250 people. It's an expansion. That's being used in an additional classroom also. Uh, we had that groundbreaking, groundbreaking a couple of weeks ago. Ribbon cutting. Ribbon cutting. See, that's why Dr. Bonds is here. It, wasn't, it was a groundbreak slash ribbon cutting. It didn't take but a couple of days to get it done. Uh, we're the only base to receive the Altus Award twice. So I know uh, we'll probably not apply again this year. Several of the bases have asked us to just bow out and let them have a chance to win. We are not applying so, this year. So. Just yeah, so anyway, I just we wanted to come forward, present you with the Altus Trophy. Uh, in front of Michael Dane, we felt that was appropriate. Put in front of him, uh, block him out. We got five votes from this side. So anyway, uh, we want to say thank you very much for what you've done. Uh, if we could, we'd like to have a photo op. That will go with, to ATC in San Antonio and their publication. And they've told me the last week they will forward it to, to the U.S. Air Force uh, because of the number of MOUs we've had in the winning of the Altus Award. So if we could take <coughs> just a couple of minutes. Unless you have any questions. You want all the council members up here for that photo Please. op? Absolutely. <coughs> Except Tommy Heber. Except Tommy Heber. All right. So. I, just, yeah, I just wanted to say, and you can move. I don't consider that disrespectful. Um, <clears throat> this next uh, grant that, that is almost finished when the governor was here for the fundraiser, the first thing he asked, he knew that we had uh, done so well g getting the grants that he and the le uh, Texas legislature uh, 
have the money, allocated the money. So he said, Caroline, what are, what are y'all going for in this next one? And I said, resiliency. And he high-fived and he said, you're the only one besides Corpus. And they dipped their toe to do a water loop. But he said "I'm so that he's so worried about our bases being resilient in many different ways. And so I just wanted you to know, I heard last week when I was at my commissioner meeting in Austin, that already the governor in his speeches is talking about at least one base in Texas has realized how serious this is. And that base would be um, a good fellow along with their city partnership and county partnership. Which we now call Great. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't mind, Robinson, go up. Thank you all for being here and um, having an opportunity to present the Altus Award information to us today. We will now go into public comment. And remember, when you come forward for public comment, you must state your name and address or your SMD area. Each citizen can speak just once per item unless asked to comment by council. Public comment will be for three minutes unless extended by council or translation services. The proponent or opponent also has five minutes unless extended by council or translation services. Council has no obligation to respond to comments or questions from the public. Any response from a member of the city council to non-agenda comments is limited to a statement of specific factual information, recitation of existing policy, and directing staff to place a subject on a future agenda. With that, do we have anyone here today who would like to offer public comment? With no one coming forward to offer public comment, we will close that section of the agenda and we will move into the consent agenda. With that, I would like to request that we pull item G off of the consent agenda and item I. Billy, do you have any items that you would like to pull? No, Mayor. Lane? Lucy? No, ma'am. Tom? Uh, Tommy? No, ma'am. Tom? No, ma'am. Harry? No. Okay. With that, may we have a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item G's and I? So moved. Second. Moved by Harry, seconded by Lane. All in favor say aye. 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 With none opposed, motion passes. <laughs> we will move into item G. Um, consider resolution ratifying an emergency expenditure in the amount of $74,500 to OMJC Signal Incorporated for the purchase of portable traffic signals at the intersection of South Cunningham Street 
and West Harris Avenue and authorizing the city manager to negotiate and execute all related documents. Shane, I just want you to kind of go through what that means, what we're buying, what will happen when we get it so the public's informed. Okay. Um, due to, uh, one, due to the uh, number of uh, major intersection knockdowns we've had in the last four or five years, and then two, the, especially the nature of this knockdown that we have, we have uh, at the intersection of Harris and Coingham, we have uh, normally our ADT is anywhere from 12 to 15,000 on Coingham, and then when you look at Harris being an ADT of around 6,000, just the volume of traffic we have right there, uh, the congestion is, is, is really horrible uh, to, to start with, and then when we have a knockdown of a traffic signal, it just increases that, that congestion and, and also the confusion of the drivers as well, too. So uh, we initiated this emergency contract so we can actually purchase two signalized light trailers, uh, which will actually, uh, a lot of people have seen these out on state highways where you see the, where you pull up to a construction site and you'll see the trailer with the arm sticking out. That's what these trailers are. And so uh, we've purchased two of those when they get here. Hopefully, gosh, we're hoping really by the end of this week, We'll see the trailers, if not hopefully by the first of next week at the latest. We're, uh, we're actually going to, we have the ability to tie those into our uh, existing cabinet uh, and our existing system, and we can actually use those um, to actually start our traffic signal and our, in our, in the phasing of that, uh, of that intersection with the signalized intersection. So, and that way it'll, it'll look just almost just like a normal intersection when we're done. We'll just have two trailers sitting on the side with the arms sticking over both sides. And so, and we, again, we can tie those directly into our cabinet and make it, uh, make it function and work Great. just like, just like a normal signal. Fantastic. Thank you. Do, does anyone have any further questions or comments for Shane on this item? Thank you for getting that done. I think it's pretty important. Move to approve by Lane, a second. second. Second by Tommy. Any public comment? <clears throat> With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. With none opposed, motion passes 7-0. Item I, consider accepting an annexation <coughs> petition for 8.401 acres of land out of South Burbank. Survey number 177, abstract number 52, City of San Angelo, Tom Green County, Texas, being part of a 25.361 acre tract described and recorded in instrument number 20161044. Official public records of Tom Green County, Texas, being a tract of land south of State Highway, Loop 306, adjacent to the city limits east of Karsten Creek Drive and west of Forster, Foster Road, and setting a public hearing on the annexation of the February 4th 2020 City Council meeting. John, would you like to talk about why this is back again, because it's been on the agenda several times, and talk about when they first petitioned for the 8.41 acres, did they in fact already know when the closing date would be? Was it part of the documents given I, to us? I, I can't answer that second question. I don't, I don't know at what point they knew when their closing date would be, but the reason this is back is subsequent to you all accepting the annexation petition and then first reading of the ordinance, um, the, the property sold to a new owner. And therefore, we have to start the process over uh, with a new annexation petition from the new owners um, because, again, you accepted a petition from the previous owner, um, and once the property changed hands, that was no longer sufficient. Uh, to meet all the legal requirements, and so uh, it's basically just going through the same steps. We've we we accepted the petition, had a public hearing and first reading. We've just got to do those again, and then hopefully get to the second reading and finalize this one. Any further questions from council on this item? Do I have a motion for approval? Move to approve. Move to move by Lane, a second by Lucy. Um, any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 With none opposed, motion passes 7-0. With that, we will move into our regular agenda. Comments regarding items on the regular agenda may be made by the public when each item is discussed as outlined above. Applicants, proponents, and appellants are expect are ex accepted from or accepted from the time limit above and instead must limit their remarks to less than five minutes. With that, we will start with um, item A, presentation of the 2019 City of San Angelo Development Corporation Annual Report. And Guy, I think you're on for this. Thank you, Mayor, Council, uh, Mr. Valenzuela. This has been a uh, very exciting year in 2019. 
We've been blessed in so many ways with lots of things that have come together. Just like to point out that the presentation that I'll be making this morning, along with uh, Michael Looney, when we get to a certain section of it, follows pretty much the same order as the uh, packet that you have in front of it, where it will provide additional details. But we have made uh, some really great progress towards our strategic initiatives that involve, you guessed it, planes, trains, and automobiles. In regard to planes, one of the things that happened this past year is that we can, had a uh, land use management study for our airport business industrial park conducted. This is a uh, sort of a layout of uh, how that, how we envision that park might come together one of these days. We also participated uh, in the San Angelo Regional Airport Master Plan. We did some clearing across from the airport that many of you seen. We leveraged uh, with the uh, operations with Shane Kelton's organization, the Lake Maintenance Division, to clear 14 acres of brush across on the Bureau of Reclamation property over there. We still have some work to do. There are piles of brush remaining that need to be cleared off of there, some stumps, and to replace a fence and that. But uh, that's going to make that just look a whole lot better. Well, People are already practice. commenting positively about it. They're very excited about it and the change in terms of the look. So it's been a great project. And we, we appreciate the partnership, too, with Shane Kelton and his folks. This is a, uh, a slide of what that looks like across there. In regard to trains, one of the things that we've done is, uh, of course, was purchase a 183.5 acre site. Uh, that's just north of uh, uh, Texas Pacifico's main yard. Uh, we've done research behind that uh, in order to accommodate local uh, commodities, uh, people that want to ship commodities out of here. That's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is that the uh, port of Presidio, there is a rail bridge across there uh, between Presidio and Okinawa, Mexico, that will be back in operation. So what our focus is going to be in this year is not only the operation of our uh, 183 and a half acre rail port, but also how we can leverage the uh, opportunities that are going to come as a result of opening up this freight corridor between Texas and Mexico. And we'll be talking a lot more about that in the coming days, months, and, and weeks. In regard to automobiles, of course, we've been heavily involved for years with the uh, Ports to Plains project. But one of the exciting things that happened this year is that House Bill 1079 was passed, which requires TxDOT to do a feasibility study in Texas on the Ports to Plains route. Uh, Mayor uh, heads up the Segment 2 committee that will be meeting again soon. We've already had several meetings uh, in will be studying that corridor that runs from Laredo up to the top of Texas. We've also been involved in the I-14 uh, Gulf Coast Strategic Highway Initiative, and one of these days, uh, I-27 and I-14 are gonna converge in San Angelo, Texas, which provides us with some amazing economic development opportunities. Uh, we were part of the high ground of Texas this past year. We hosted the uh, annual conference here in San Angelo in our first year in that brought a lot of folks in and helped our economy already. We also became part of the Texas Midwest Community Network, uh, and their annual conference was also held in San Angelo and brought in about 250 people into that. And, uh, both Michael Looney and I sit on that particular board, and I sit on the board of directors of the high ground of Texas. So uh, regionally, in our economic development efforts, we've made some great inroads. One of the things that happened in the past year that has been of great benefit to San Angelo was the comprehensive housing study. Uh, that helped match up the uh, both the supply and demand and uh, as a uh, Mike Boyd had mentioned this morning, we're beginning to solve a lot of the housing problems for Goodfellow Air Force Base. That was a special emphasis in this study. 
and it is a result to uh, we already had some projects uh, in progress but we've added a lot more in all levels of housing and especially in the target area of houses in the 160 180 dollar range uh, they're going to benefit this in addition to that information we got a whole lot of updated demographic information that continues to uh, be a benefit to us in san angelo our business uh, retention and expansion program really took off this year just to highlight some of them uh, we are, are providing to principal LA, LED. Uh, they're bringing in their manufacturing operations out of China. We're providing them the opportunity to uh, receive $260,000 worth of incentives. Uh, Carter Fentress Engineering, that's a smaller project, but uh, we were able to provide $20,000 incentive for them. Uh, Jay's Wild Game Processing, a $50,000 incentive. Uh, SMC Global, which just continues to grow and amaze us uh, here, a $200,000 uh, uh, potential to earn incentives in regard to uh, property taxes. West Texas Steel, a $59,000 grant. Intertel, $25,000 grant for expansion. Uh, double barrel fabrication, $70,000 grant. By the way, there are more details if you want to see exactly how that's done it within your-, your Well, how many team. jobs, based off the ones you just went through, how many new jobs have been created? Uh, I don't have that information totaled up at this particular uh, point in time, but I can get that information to you. I believe it's in your packet. Uh, that. Uh, there'd be 208 new and indirect jobs created, uh, 29 direct and indirect jobs retained, uh, 33.45 million in annual economic output with 7 million in capital investments in those projects. Has the process of moving uh, principal LED jobs and the manufacturing from China happened? Is that complete? Uh, or is it still in the process? The, the jobs won't necessarily come from China. They will be, they could be adding people here for that manufacturing operation, but that's, they already had the equipment in place, so they've received part of their incentives, and then they earn the incentives for uh, adding employees uh, as those are done over a period of time. Uh, in regard to our business resource uh, center and our business factory, we uh, have three tenants currently in the business factory. Uh, we've had 105 total companies in there since inception. Who are the three tenants as we speak? We have uh, uh, Lieutenant uh, General Hawkins has a, a cyber organization up there. Centurion uh, Planning is in there. And then one of our consultants, uh, Roger Horton, has an office within the, that. Uh, we have 18 employees that are full-time and seven part-time that are in, in, uh, working within that center. Uh, return on investments in its inception for the business factory has been $1.4 million. Uh, total gross payroll is about $1.3 million. And in this past year, we uh, graduated Odom RD, uh, which has been a very successful and so there have been a total of 566 jobs within our community. Uh, in regard to the tax increment reinvestment zone, the, the, the tiers projects that we work in cooperation with our development services organization and uh, Shannon Scott uh, administers that. I'm not sure why that's not working so well today. There. Within that, we've had a, uh, 11 total tiers agreements are executed for total projected capital investment of uh, $2.7 million. We have five tiers agreements in the north zone for a capital investment of $1.7 million. Six tiers agreements in the uh, south zone for capital investment of $1 million. And here's some of those projects. In the south zone, 
Rex East Concho uh, received a tears grant, so did eight East Concho. Uh, Fuentes Cafe at 101 South uh, Chadburn received a tears grant. Uh, so did Old Central Firehouse Bed and Brew over on Magdalene. Uh, other South uh, Zone projects that are in progress are 123 North Chadburn, that's the Buffalo Soldier Art Gallery, and at 305 West Tug, uh, Dean and Lyon Barger projects. In the North Zone, uh, all of these projects are in progress right now at uh, JKLS Properties at uh, 1715 North Chadburn. Uh, the gentleman, Senior Changs, Icon Cinema, and Dollar General also received grants. In terms of capital improvements in our business and industrial park continues to grow. We are a certified, AEP certified, shovel ready uh, business park with over 700 acres. And so within the park, uh, we've, uh, in our industrial park phase one, we have 16 acres that are currently under contract for, uh, at a cost of $416,000. Uh, that'll be revenue for us. Uh, seven acres are under option contract that would be worth $175,000 to us. Uh, we're working on industrial uh, park phase 2.1. A uh, bid opening was held in December. Uh, we received a bid of $1.1 million. It was accepted by uh, COSA DC. Uh, industrial park 2.2, we had our bid opening in December uh, with a bid of $2.2 million, and that was also accepted in December of this year. The airport master plan, uh, we said we were involved with that. Our, our, the consultant is Centurion Planning and Design, and they've completed the following. Uh, their opportunities assessment for it, the stakeholder meetings, they've conducted market research, economic analysis, demand assessment, uh, aviation-related industry research, and they've developed a conceptual site plan. Uh, on the airport gateway improvement project that we showed you earlier, the city lake maintenance staff completed clearing of approximately 14 acres of brush. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 58 piles of tree and brush that need to be removed and then approximately uh, 4,000 linear feet of fence that requires replacement. This is on the Bureau of uh, Reclamation property across there and, and we obtained their permission working with them during the year. Uh, we're involved with uh, in financing the Chadburn Streetscape project. Uh, we've committed $3.75 million over uh, five years. That's about $750,000 a year for that. Uh, we will have uh, final phase A plans that are due at the, in January. And then a notice to proceed has been issued for phase B of those plans as well. So we're well into that project. Uh, we also were involved with, uh, as Mike Boyd mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the Cresma Dining Facility at Goodfellow Air Force Base. Uh, they involved a grant of $1.5 million for the expansion of that dining facility at Goodfellow Air Force Base. Here's some photos of that. What an exciting facility to see that uh, really does a lot of good for Good fellow Air Force Base. Okay, and now we're going to be talking about targeted marketing. And as you know, our uh, marketing functions and business recruitment are uh, contracted with the Chamber of Commerce. So uh, my best friend, Michael Looney, is coming up to tell you the exciting things that have, are going on in regard to targeted marketing. Thank you. Thank you. Would you also bring me a, a copy of that packet? I didn't get one. You can bring me one. They got copies. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Michael Looney. I'm the VP of Economic Development for the San Angelo Chamber of Commerce, and I'm pleased to be here. It's it's always great to kick off the new year by a look back at 2019 to uh, to talk about some really great stuff that's going on and some really awesome stuff that's coming down the pike really rapidly. So we're 
kind of lead off, we're really, really very fortunate to be here at this point in time in the history of San Angelo. And a lot of really great things are happening because we have a very diversified economic base. So uh, as opposed to being a completely reliant on one or two industries, we have a whole quilt work of them, which is great because it supports our economy with like a multi-legged table. And so uh, what we do at the chamber is we uh, target market to industry, old sectors that um, we believe in, industrial sectors that are very durable, that are long lasting, that are not just a, um, uh, emotional market-driven uh, recruitment where, you know, you have some companies that come in for a, you know, brief period and then they leave as soon as their market's up. So we go for companies that don't do that because we, we like to follow the, the, the lead of the Ethicons uh, as one of our great partners uh, has done for over 50 years. We have uh, accomplished a pretty big feat, uh, $216 million, very, very provable. This is probably a low number in... Um, transactions in 2019 and that was those were chamber touched transactions so you have the chamber touch transactions that we bring in that we bring to the table and we work on with co city c and also with the county commissioners um, and that so that number doesn't count count the uh, numbers that were brought in by uh, co city c's team so if you combine them both together you get an even larger amount uh, but that's in that's in capital investment and also in, in, uh, in economic yield. Economic yield, really what we're doing is we're counting how much of the salaries, really. Um, and so, uh, again, uh, sustainable injury, uh, injuries. There's no injuries in this presentation. So sustainable industrial growth sectors are uh, pipelines. Those are several companies that we've worked with and we are currently working with pipeline support. So not just the companies that are building them, but the companies that support them. Solar power generation, that's really made a really strong push the past couple of years in Tom Green County. Um, we uh, are very close with several uh, renewable energy companies that are very pleased uh, with uh, the way they've been treated in Tom Green County. And um, right now we're working on a total of five different solar power generation plants. One of them uh, is under construction and that is out on 2288. Uh, it's a very large, uh, almost 4,000 acre development, uh, 200 megawatts of AC power. Doesn't create a lot of uh, permanent jobs, a lot of construction jobs, I can tell you that much, but not a lot of permanent jobs. But that's okay because we've got kind of a real small uh, surplus of uh, employee available, availability here in Tom Green County, 3% 3, 3 unemployment. So when you can generate uh, uh, the construction of a $180 million plant, um, it's basically a robot. It's run by two people. Uh, that's a that's a pretty good bet, and uh, so it produces a really good yield in taxes to uh, the the uh, the county and also to uh, the independent school districts. Uh, oil field support it's a big part of our uh, of our economy, um, but there's a difference between your drilling and your exploration and your just general oil field support. And so we go after oil field support companies that are going to run kind of no matter what uh, the price of WTI really does. Um, Heavy haul logistics, over the road and rail. We are in a very interesting spot um, that we have learned um, in between the northern part of the United States and Canada and the Gulf Coast. And um, we're exploiting that uh, strategic position because we are right in the middle of food, fuel, and fiber land. A lot of those products are harvested here, grown here, and then they're trucked uh, up to the northwest and down to the Gulf Coast for exportation at the ports. Uh, so we found a, a, a really a real hotbed of uh, activity in over-the-road transportation. One thing that I would mention that's kind of interesting, uh, I'll put these little factoids out there. Um, there's this thing called electronic records. So when you are running your equipment from Houston, say, to, I don't know, call it sub-Seattle, you have to make a stop uh, by virtue of your electronic records. And San Angelo is at an awesome junction point where those electronic stops are required. And so we find that uh, a lot of uh, your very long haul over the road truckers are stopping in San Angelo and a lot of those companies that do added distribution are wanting to put hubs here. So, uh, and then chemicals, uh, we're becoming a little chemical uh, uh, city here with uh, companies that are, that are doing a lot of oil field chemicals but these companies don't just usually do one, one or two types of chemicals. They do many, many dozens. And so we've been really blessed. As Guy said with SMC Global Corporation, this is a company that came to us um, that we'd gotten tipped off by uh, looking for a little warehouse in Midland. And now it's turned into three facilities, 130,000 square feet of real estate, 17 full-time employees. And these are well-paid employees. 
um, full benefits, and they're continuing to grow. And so we're spending a lot of time on uh, focusing on industries that we know have a future other than oil, to put it quite simply. There's a shot of SMC Global, $5.7 million in annual economic impact, $3.8 million in gross annual product yield, 130,000 square feet, three facilities. They're in, uh, they're in Lucy's SMD and in Tommy's SMD. This picture is of the old uh, R.G. Berry building, and a lot of people, I kind of learned about it as we were going, uh, R.G. Berry, a large uh, clothing shoe company, uh, had a very large facility that uh, had uh, kind of gone empty for a long time. And uh, it worked out absolutely brilliantly for SMC Global for their storage needs. And the warehouse is in awesome condition. Allen's Transport, this is uh, one of those heavy haul chemical companies. They do both. Uh, they're based out of uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And uh, we have uh, sold them acreage in the industrial park. So they're going to build a, uh, a terminal. And they sent us a picture last Friday because I said, what, what is your terminal going to look like? And we've seen the renderings, but, but you know, kind of what is it really going to look like? And they sent this picture, and I thought, that's pretty impressive. That's, a, that's what they call a tank farm in Canada. Um, that's very, very clean. What that is is that's drag-reducing agents that are injected into the pipeline. Um, drag-reducing agents are a long-chain polymer, and uh, they don't survive the journey to help accelerate the uh, oil through the pipeline down to its final destination. So it's got a good... Uh, it, it's sustainable. Let's just leave it at that. And uh, that's going to be a 25,000 square foot terminal, 10 new employees, uh, estimated $2.7 uh, million in annual economic yield. And that's just when after they get started after their first year. Uh, again, there's a, there's a shot of the construction of the piers of the uh, 200 megawatt AC um, photovoltaic energy plant. That's a, that's a big word for a solar power generation plant. It was actually built by Recurrent Energy. Um, Signal, Signal Energy is the actual construction company, Recurrent's uh, division of Canadian Solar, and uh, halfway through construction, they uh, sold the project to Duke Energy, uh, yet Recurrent has another project called Brave Post that is uh, also uh, in the pre-stages of construction as well. Uh, so that's going to provide two full-time jobs, but again, it's a $180 million capital investment in Tom Green County. It's outstanding. And uh, we did assist uh, with uh, the county commissioners on a 312 and a 313 agreement, which I can explain more about what that is, but I'll do that later, unless you're, at, unless you're really curious. Hardin Creek 27, this is a cottage community. So if we're recruiting these companies and we're, and uh, Shannon, uh, Scott, and Guy Andrews, and Bob Scheman are doing all this business retention and expansion, we're growing these companies, we're importing workers, we're hiring workers from within the community, we need some place for them to live. And this is the, the Chambers effort. Uh, this is a developer that we know from Austin uh, that builds cottage communities. And uh, this is one that we've talked about in the past, but it is continuing to move forward. And um, uh, we expect that it's supposed to break ground probably in the next probably two to three weeks. Um, and uh, the signs for construction, the, the contractor that's building the, prop, the project are actually up on the property right now. It's going to be 250 units. And uh, when we started presenting these, this concept, uh, the base picked up on it very, very quickly. And uh, we had a comment from a senior leader saying, that looks like bachelor officer quarters. And we said, well, it probably is. And so um, these are little units. They're about 900 square feet, up to 1,000 square feet. And... Um, the uh, the way we the way the developer started off with base pricing is uh, we looked at the uh, allowances that are granted to uh, officers and enlisted in the Air Force in this region of uh, the state, and so they use that as a platform. So we're really excited about that project, and uh, also uh, if we have all these employees and and all these companies that are moving up uh, in their in their respective sectors, uh, we want to be a part of helping them in all kinds of different ways, not just with housing and facilities and sometimes with assistance from Coast City C, but also with training. That's a really, really big component. And we've, the Chamber has worked really closely with uh, TMAC, which is the Texas Manufacturers Assistance Center, which is based in San Antonio. And it's been around since 1947. And it is, it is paid by the federal government uh, to help companies like, you know, for example, Ethicon or SMC Global, and they come in and do industrial certification trainings, the same exact trainings that you could do at Toyota or Yokohama Tire or Ford Motor Company, exact same curriculum, exact same classes. These are usually two to five day long classes. 
at extremely low cost uh, to the students or to the companies. And we host, we bring those, comp those, those classes to San Angelo. We did one last May that was really, really successful. We had 41 applicants. We can only take 12. Um, and uh, it, uh, it was uh, extremely successful. It was a, uh, a, uh, a lean manufacturing certification course. And uh, we're going to actually do four more this year, and the next one's going to be in February, February 2nd. And so uh, we're really pleased to be offering those to our community. And the response has been really overwhelming. Uh, and we're doing this in, in conjunction with Ethicon, too. They've loaned us uh, one of their uh, guys, one of their members of leadership, a guy named Mike Berry, who is, a, who is the director of training for Ethicon. And so we sort of deputized him to help us uh, uh, conduct these courses and, and organize them. And then finally, um, one of the things that we find uh, very fulfilling is working with the Rodeo. And uh, one of the, the components of the rodeo that, that may, you know, we may not think about during the actual presentation of the rodeo and the show and the livestock show is the ag mechanical uh, program, which is really, really amazing because you have these youngsters from all over the state that build absolutely awesome uh, industrial strength and industrial size, very, very complex pieces of equipment. And um, whether that's from automatic gates to, um, 12, you know, 10 cylinder horsepower engines that are used to pump water from one levee to the next down in South Texas. And so what we do is we sponsor part of the ag um, mechanical show and the awards ceremony. We're also in, instilling, installing a, a scholarship. And we've been working with a lady from the rodeo to help us do that. And, um, and this is a way for us to actually put our local manufacturers together with prospective employees. And the way we do that is we will actually visit um, with a delegation on each day of the Ag Mechanical Show, and we will have um, brochures on, on the, the San Angelo Regional Manufacturers Alliance Program. And then we'll have the manufacturers from San, from San Angelo go and talk to the adults that are the custodians of the different teams. And uh, the response has been really great. In fact, last year we got 35 thank you cards from students from all over the state acknowledging what San Angelo has done for, for, their, for their projects. So that concludes the report. Are there any questions about economic development? Any comments? Any, any comments? questions? Thank you very much, Michael and Guy. Thank you. Just one last comment. I do have a few extra copies of the annual report. If anyone would like to have those, you can also, it'll be available on our website at economicdevelopmentsanangelo.com uh, if you want an electronic copy of, of that. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll move on to item B, update on the repair of the culverts under Avenue R. Shane, would you please come forward? Mayor, back in back in April, there was a water leak under Avenue R, and uh, due to the due to the nature of that leak and everything, we sustained some damage to the culverts that actually run under Avenue R. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, due to the nature of the damage that we had there, we actually had to hire a structural engineer to come in here and assess assess that damage and then design the plans for the repair of it. So uh, with that, we kind of timeline here on the deal. We uh, contracted with Friesen Nichols April 22nd. Uh, we published uh, the bids of their designs um, to go out for bid October 24th. We awarded the repair to Future, Future Vest Construction. Uh, November 12th, uh, after we got all the paperwork and- November uh, 12th, 2020. November uh, 20, whoops, sorry, 2019. Yep. <laughs> got a little carried away there. <laughs> uh, 2019, and uh, we issued notice to proceed January 9th, and they have started the repairs. Uh, expect about 90 days for those repairs, and then once those repairs are complete on the, uh, on the actual culvert portion of it, uh, then my crews will come in and we will take care of the, uh, of the pavement over the, top of the, over the top of those culverts. So that's where we you are. So where that big hole is. Correct, where that big hole is. Yep. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, so hopefully, uh, like I said, just due to the nature of it and due to the, the structural um, components that, uh, of, and the nature of that, we wanted to make sure that it was, uh, we had the structural engineers come in and take a look at it and actually give proper design and uh, further repair of, of that structure. 
So that whole bridge area won't have to come down. You're nope. going to be able to nope. fill that hole we and make will, that hole will, go away. Correct. We will be able to repair repair the existing uh, structure that's there. So, yeah, it, it, a whole lot cheaper that way. <laughs> and effective. And effective, yes, and effective. And that's why we hired the structural engineer to design it. So, Thank you. Yes, Harry. I want to say thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I probably get half a dozen phone calls every every week on this because it is in my area and of course it's right there adjacent to the elks so every time i go over there the members are asking me hey how about this so i do know that they've been working and certainly appreciate that um, they did get firsthand uh, knowledge on thursday and friday of uh, why that hole needs to be fixed because the water was flowing down that that canal so uh, we appreciate it, and uh, when it gets done, I think there's going to be a celebration at the Elks. We could have a ribbon cutting, <laughs> opening it back up, you know. <laughs> yep, it will. We'll get it back up just as soon as we can. So, And we're hoping that, well, we, we want the rain, but and rain will delay us a little bit, but we're hoping that this, this will be quicker than 90 days as well, Well, if too, you think, so. okay, so we're saying that perhaps by April, um, May 1st, it might be done. And Yes, ma'am, and we're hoping prior to that. So. Okay. Yeah, we're hoping it's, it's done quicker. So. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. We will move on to item C, which is first reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving Z19-17, a rezoning from the light manufacturing zoning district to the general commercial zoning district being two 0.87 acres located at 801 Rust Street and an unaddressed lot directly north across from East Avenue D. John? Thank you. John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. As you mentioned, this is rezoning from lot manufacturing to general commercial. Uh, this is for Rust Street Ministries. Uh, this is their existing site. They basically just want to build a parking lot across the street, uh, across Avenue D. Um, to do that, they need this rezoning, and since their existing use really isn't a manufacturing use, it made sense for them to rezone the entire property uh, to the CG zoning district. Uh, as you can see, the future land use designation for that is uh, commercial, and so that makes sense. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, lot manufacturing in that particular area, so that also makes sense. Uh, and particularly given the neighborhood there uh, uh, off to the east, um, Commercial makes more sense than lot manufacturing in any case. Uh, just a couple of pictures. There's their existing facility as well as the lot across the street where they intend to build the parking lot. And then just looking in the other direction at what's across the street from them. Is that apartment complex, it's vacant, right? That right there? You know, actually, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's boarded no, it's, up. It, this one right here is uh -huh. actually a church. Oh, it's a church. Yeah. And is it occupied? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, we did send out our notifications to the surrounding properties. We received one in favor and none in opposition. Uh, just some of the reasons for our recommendation for approval. I think I've mentioned those already. Uh, staff did recommend approval, as did the Planning Commission unanimously. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do I have questions from Council on this item? With no questions on this item, do I have a motion for approval? So moved. So okay. moved by Harry, seconded by Lane. Is there any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take, oh, sorry, there is public comment. Good morning, Council. Good morning. My name is Ed Houston. It's my privilege to serve on the uh, board of Rust Street Ministries and am um, appearing here to represent our interests. Rust Street Ministries had an humble beginning about 25 years ago in a closet under a stairway at Johnson Street Church of Christ. And we now occupy converted uh, warehouse buildings that essentially the whole block between Avenue D and Highland on Rust Street. Uh, in, 19, in 2019, we served 19,871 people, uh, 8,264 families. We provided 171,000 pounds of food, 
76,597 items of clothing. We have aligned ourselves with two other entities who share our vision, those being the uh, Neighbors Cafe. Neighbors Cafe serves between 150 and 175 people a day, uh, free meals seven days a week. Uh, Young Life is a, is a national organization that uh, uh, aligns with at-risk youth, and we have taken them under our roof, and they operate out of our facility, and uh, uh, about uh, over 100 of these young people meet there twice a week. We also uh, are next door to Fort Concho and to Fort Concho Elementary. And uh, we have run out of room to provide parking for the people we serve. And uh, so we are asking to be rezoned. We obtained this uh, lot across the street from us from uh, the Hanks Ministry. And we are asking permission to, to uh, rezone this so that we can continue to expand. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, any other uh, further public comment? With none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 With none opposed, motion passes 7-0. Item D, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving Z19-18 a rezoning from the general commercial, heavy commercial zoning district to neighborhood commercial zoning district being 1.307 acres located at 401, 405, and 409 West Avenue Y, 2815 Ben Ficklin Road, and 410 West Avenue Z. Thank you. Uh, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, as you mentioned, this is zoning from uh, general commercial, heavy commercial, uh, to a neighborhood commercial, which will allow, uh, it, it would ultimately still allow some commercial uses, but would also allow for the uh, homes that the applicant is proposing on uh, his site. Uh, you can see here, here in blue is the applicant's uh, properties, uh, but as I'll talk about, the city staff is recommending also rezoning those adjacent properties. You can see that in the, in the future land use plan, all of this area is proposed for a neighborhood center. Uh, and given that designation, the more heavy commercial uses would not be considered appropriate. And with those small lots, heavy commercial would be difficult anyway. Uh, you can see that much of this is already zoned neighborhood commercial and, and adding the applicant's property. Uh, we thought it just made sense to, to include the remainder of that block, uh, with the exception of the one home that's zoned for single family. Uh, we have contacted two of the three property owners, and they are in agreement that uh, that is best for them to rezone. Uh, the one property owner on the vacant property there is an out-of-state owner from California. We did send them the, um, the letter notice, did not receive any input back, but had no other way to contact them to find out if they were uh, supportive or not. But again, we did send them the letter, and they did not send that back in opposition. As I mentioned, we did send out our notices, uh, zero in favor, zero in opposition. We also talked to the school that's across the street, and they also uh, indicated no opposition. Uh, as I mentioned, the conference plan does designate this as neighborhood center, which then makes sense for the neighborhood commercial rezoning. Uh, it, as I also mentioned, it, it allows for the single-family homes on those two lots, which is what the applicant is, is intending. Uh, and this general commercial or heavy commercial uses have not occurred at this location. And again, given the lot sizes and what's around it, uh, we don't think that makes sense long term uh, in, in any case. Uh, staff does recommend approval and the Planning Commission recommended approval with a 4-2 vote. I'll just note that the two in opposition uh, had some discomfort uh, rezoning those properties uh, without the owners requesting it to be rezoned. Uh, subsequent to that, we did, as I mentioned, contact uh, all but one of those property owners, uh, and they are supportive. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do we often uh, put forward an app, uh, a desire to change the zoning without um, ownership of the properties being included from the beginning? 
Uh, we do. We've we've brought. We'll probably do a handful of those a year if if a, if one property owner requests a rezoning, and for whatever reason we think it makes sense to rezone an adjacent property, uh, we will uh, you know, bring that to you for consideration. Uh, oftentimes, as in this case, most of the property owners are in agreement that, uh, given the circumstances, it's actually better for them uh, for the rezoning, uh, and so uh, it's a case by case. But we often will look at that. Do I have uh, questions from council or comments? With none, do I have a motion for approval? Move to approve. Move to approve by Harry. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Tommy. Any public comment? New Hamptons, uh, single district six. Um, Following up on your question, uh, it occurs to me, well, what if the person in California uh, is in the hospital or something is not able to respond? What do you do then? Or do you, if they respond later, what happens? Uh, do they get to uh, protest for free or, or do we charge them on that? Thank you. Well, I would say depending on the vote, if it's already done, I think it's a solid into the conversation on that, number one. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. With none opposed, motion passes. E, first reading and public hearing of one, an ordinance approving CP19-03, an amendment to the City of San Angeles comprehensive plan, changing certain lands from the commercial and neighborhood future land uses to the neighborhood center future land use being 30 0.267 acres located between South Bryant Boulevard, Kimry Lane, and Ben Ficklin Road. Thank you again, John James. Um, this is an area, this is Sonresis. They have a, a therapeutic horse riding facility and they've just added a ropes course uh, on their property. Uh, and the, the short version of why they're asking for this is you can see the plan development here in blue. Um, the ropes course that they've constructed extends beyond that property onto other property they own uh, that's shown there in red, uh, and that is was not included in their plan development. So this is um, effectively expanding the boundary of their plan development to include that additional land. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of other provisions that were added by the Planning Commission to that plan development as well, but the impetus for this was to expand their boundary to include the additional development that they've done. Uh, since then. Uh, just a few pictures of the area. Uh, you can see some other new construction related to their riding facilities. Uh, this is part of their ropes course and you can see some of the construction out here in the in the background there is the property that is being added to the plan development including the zip line that you can see there. Uh, this is their concept plan. Uh, you can see in gray here is the area that we're talking about the expansion of their plan development basically into that additional area that they are um, growing into. Uh, the two issues that came up with the Planning Commission from these are homes back behind. Um, one of the recommendations is a screening of these trees that you can see here, which they were okay with, uh, planting trees along their fence line. Um, the other issue was there was a concern from one neighbor about them potentially creating a parking lot back there. That's not part of their plans, and so they were okay adding a provision saying uh, they will not add parking within this rear area close to the homes. Otherwise, it's just all the normal provisions that already existed in the plan development. Uh, you can see here allowing the various uses, um, the horse riding area, and a caretaker's residence as well. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, adding these two additional um, uh, provisions with the trees and the uh, ropes course. Questions for John? Go ahead, continue. I was just going to say we, we did send out our notifications. Um, we did not, or we received one in favor, uh, one in opposition, but that one, as you can see, is outside the 200 feet. Uh, as I also mentioned, some of those homes adjacent came to the Planning Commission with some concerns, but with the changes uh, addressed by the Planning Commission, uh, they were then supportive, and so there's no formal opposition within the 200 feet. Okay. Questions, 
comments? Do we have, do we need two motions here, John, or are we just dealing with item number one with what you've just presented? I presented both, so it's it's both amending the comprehensive plan as well as the plan development. I believe we've done those in a single motion in the past uh, to approve both. Or you could take them separately if if it was a case where you might approve one and not the other, but you can you I can only do read it in one item one. I don't think I read item two. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't rec realize didn't. that. But so okay. it, I can go ahead and read. Item two, and read we can include two. it as one, but I only read item one. So item two, an ordinance amending PD 06-05, a rezoning from the ranch and estate zoning district to the plan development zoning district to expand the existing PD 06-05 boundary to allow for a new rope challenge course and accessory structures associated with an existing daycare and therapeutic course riding facility being a total of 10.954 acres located at 5185 and 5191 South Bryant Boulevard. Is there any additional information uh, now having read item two, or is the information presented inclusive of item one and two? That's correct. It included both. Okay, so we only need one motion, I'll, and I'll Tommy will make that motion. Do I have two. a second? Second. A second by Tom. <coughs> Public comment, please. With no public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 There are none opposed. Motion passes 7-0. We will move into item F, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving PD 19-09, a rezoning from the general commercial heavy commercial zoning district to the planned development zoning district to allow for a multifamily housing development comprising of 20 two-family duplex buildings with a total of 40 residential units with associated management office and storage units and an existing telecommunication tower facility being 2.15 acres located between East Avenue D, South Oaks Street, East Washington Drive, and Orient Street. John? Thank you. Again, John James. Um, as you mentioned, here is Oak Street and Washington, and you can see the it's basically the entire block. Uh, bounded by those four streets. Uh, just for reference, this is the fort uh, just across Oak Street here, and so that'll that'll come into one of the recommendations uh, in just a minute. Uh, this area is in the long-term plan for commercial, um, although uh, residential, like is being suggested, is considered appropriate as part of a commercial area uh, as well, and so this rezoning would be from this general commercial, heavy commercial, to a plan development uh, to allow for the... Uh, the apartments or the duplexes. Uh, just Make a few, sure you call them duplexes. These yeah. are not apartments, they're duplexes. For the, uh, th there's just a few pictures of the area. Uh, you can see the block. There's some con uh, deconstruction of some of the existing foundations and things on the site. You can see piled up there, but obviously that'll be cleaned up. Uh, as you mentioned, there's an existing telecommunications tower on the back side of the property that will Is remain. that owned by Mickey Faber as well? Uh, I would defer to him if when okay. he speaks. Uh, on the ownership of that, uh, but it is on this property and the plan development accommodates that existing use on the property. Um, actually, let me go back here. There's this uh, adjacent to that telecom and you'll see it on the site plan uh, is the area where the offices for the uh, duplex uh, complex would be. Uh, you can see just across the street are the fort buildings. Um, one of the reasons that's relevant is he's proposing for the front facades of the buildings that will face Oak Street uh, to include some elements to um, mimic the style and character of those fort buildings uh, to recognize and, and make sure it's a higher quality look on that side. Uh, this is the layout. You can see the cell tower here. The leasing office for the duplexes will be on the other uh, southwest corner. And then all of this part of the site will be uh, the duplexes themselves. Uh, one of the reasons this comes to you as a planned development rather than just the multifamily zoning that might otherwise be considered um, wanting to move the buildings a little bit closer to Oak Street instead of having it set back with the parking in front, the buildings will be right up close, uh, which will make the aesthetics nicer you know, uh, across from the fort and having the parking internal, as you can see here, uh, with the buildings closer to the street. 
as well as some changes uh, to fence heights and, and some of that. Uh, rationale for approval, I think I've mentioned most of these, but it is consistent with uh, our comprehensive plan. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the housing study does recommend or indicates a demand for affordable housing like apartments and duplexes, uh, and this will help uh, meet that demand. Uh, we did send our notifications. You can see we did receive one in opposition. I uh, don't believe there's any comments as to why that was uh, they were opposed, but they did send in their notice uh, in opposition. Uh, staff does recommend approval uh, with the five conditions recommended. Uh, the Planning Commission also uh, recommended approval. Uh, they also uh, recommended an additional condition or actually to amend one of the conditions to say that any fence on lot 4A, which I'll, I'll point out in a second, uh, have a maximum height of six feet and be non-opaque. Um, the way the PD was worded, it would have allowed an eight foot fence uh, that you couldn't see through. And because that's on the property, I may have to go back, it's, it's on the piece of property with the uh, leasing office. Uh, so basically any fencing in this area would have to be see-through uh, partly to help uh, visitors see where where do I go to the leasing office and as I understand it the applicant is fine with that condition that additional condition <coughs> uh, these are the conditions uh, I think I've mentioned most of these but uh, the additional condition there on the fence height it would allow fence heights in the front to be a six foot wrought iron uh, normally front yard fences are limited to four feet uh, given the layout and design of this a see-through wrought iron type fence that's six feet makes sense. Uh, it is. It does require that it be consistent generally with the concept plan that they've proposed. It would require them to submit for the urban design review. Uh, no permanent use of intermodal containers on the site. And then exterior lighting will be directed so that it doesn't spill over onto adjacent properties. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'd like to start off by saying how excited I am about this um, idea. It fits in so many ways with strategic, strategically what we need to be doing with housing. And one is, is in the most recent military meetings, they have particularly indicated that duplexes and townhomes are of huge importance to them. The location of this to Goodfell is a good location. The fact that the Mickey or the developer is willing to spend the money to make sure it ties in with one of our most important historic um, items, which is Fort Concho, was very important to me. It addresses housing. It will help support the housing needs um, that we have. Um, I am very excited and can't wait for the shovel to hit the dirt and the project to start. So I'm very thankful someone's come up with this idea, this location, this concept. I'm all in. Any other questions or comments? That. Do I have a motion? So moved. A second? second? Second by Lucy. Any public comment? With none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed, motion passes. Let's get it started. Thank you. Item G, first reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving an amendment to the master thoroughfare thorough fair plan component of the San Angelo Comprehensive Plan in an area south of Pulliam Street, east of Bell Street, and west of Loop 306, and north of the Concho River. John? Thank you. Uh, again, John James, Director of Planning and Development Services. Um, this, it, this map's a little confusing, so I'm going to kind of go through it step by step to explain what, what's happening uh, in just a second. But basically what is happening on this uh, property is our long-range transportation plan, or what we call the thoroughfare plan, uh, has roads within this uh, area that you see on the map. Here's uh, Loop 306 in Pulliam. Uh, here's the park complex right there. Um, these roads that we've shown on our plan don't exactly match the development proposal that has, uh, in fact, already been approved for uh, this site. The preliminary plat for this site, including the golf course and housing, uh, this is the quicksand golf course, um, and so basically this is amending our thoroughfare plan to have the street layout match uh, what's on their development plan. This is that development plan. I know it's a little bit hard to see here, but uh, just for reference, uh, you can see the home lots and the, the golf course. 
Uh, and again, the whole purpose of this is to match the streets so that they, they line up. Uh, just an aerial photo of the area uh, in case there are questions or that might help with the discussion. Um, uh, zoning of the area, uh, you can see here. And so the amendment, basically everything in yellow, if it's got a yellow highlight around it, those are all of the things being removed from the thoroughfare plan. And Meaning all, they don't exist. Uh, right. They will no longer be on the plan. And then everything... And they don't exist as Rosenau. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, and everything that's not in yellow, the, the red lines and the blue lines, are the new locations for those proposed roads. Uh, and so uh, you've got uh, Harris here, uh, and this is really just a, sh a shifting of it. It goes down a little bit and tees into... Uh, what will be an extension of Smith Boulevard. Then there's a little bit of an offset, and then it comes around like that. Uh, Smith Boulevard, basically the, the north-south street that they've shown, or that we've shown on our plan, will just be shifted over again to match their development plan. It will tie into Smith, and so it'll, it'll make a continuous uh, roadway down to the south. Uh, similarly, our future arterial extension of Roosevelt Street uh, basically follows the same path. Uh, but right in here, our current plan shows it coming up to Loop 306 here. Um, this plan shifts it down a little bit. Uh, and then because it's shifted down, it allows for the elimination of this other collector street. And then this Loop Street, um, not sure that ever made sense, but we're removing that off the plan as well. So how does that, on the Rio Concho Drive one across, how does that impact the Texas Bank Sports Complex, the city maintenance yard, or the school district's maintenance yard, whichever that is. And then there's that um, South Angel draw or something in there. So how does this, is this the best route possible for best lowest cost investment in that transportation street concept? We believe so, and I think I have a zoom in that'll answer a couple of those questions. But uh, yes, give, given the layout of the proposed development plan of the developers, uh, this makes the most sense, both for their development, but also from the city's perspective to ensure interconnectivity of roads and streets to allow, you know, people to get into and out of this neighborhood, uh, as well as, for example, the arterial streets that get people, you know, from these neighborhoods over to the loop, uh, ultimately. Uh, we think it is the best. Uh, so there's layout. no, in this concept, there's no need if you're to execute it to buy additional lands or remove buildings in order to make these streets happen? Well, with, with maybe a couple of exceptions, let me go back. Uh, let me answer one of your questions here. Where, where the Rio Concho, the road that basically goes through the park, um, originally that was shown to be an extension so that the park road would basically continue on. Uh, and I think there's some concern about making the park road a through street. Agreed. And so with this new arterial coming through, the park road will basically just tee into that, and it will be a park road that could be, uh, gates could be closed, for example, either during events or uh, you know after hours or something. And so uh, it would we the city would be able to avoid that becoming a through route uh, of traffic. Uh, in times where that made sense. Go back to, I think the aerial photo may help answer a couple of your questions. You can see the draw that comes through here. Uh, there will have to be a bridge over that draw to connect the arterial from one side to the other. And that's the East Angelo draw. Uh, that's correct. And as you, it comes right through here. And so uh, this road extension would have to come across that uh, at some point. Um, it's a little hard to see, but there is an existing mobile home park right in this area, and where that extension of Roosevelt comes through, uh, it would clip the northern end of that. And so, at some point in the future, um, when this, you know, the, the developer is responsible for everything on their site, but anything in here would either be the responsible of some future developer, or the city would have to uh, continue those uh, roadways at that point. Uh, so the city might have to acquire. Uh, two or four uh, of the northern end lots of that mobile home park in order to get that road through. So there are there is a little bit of existing development. Uh, there's also um, potentially it might clip a portion of the city maintenance facility there. And so uh, at the point at which that arterial gets built, 
uh, the city would have to look at uh, some different options for, um, you know, moving some parking or um, shifting some things on that site uh, in order to accommodate that future road. But again, as, as we looked at this with uh, everyone from public works, engineering, um, and planning staff, everybody believed that this layout, this roadway, as we've shown it here, is the best uh, location for that. I think I answered all of your questions. John, just you did. Just one second. Who's on first, Billy? Ladies first. There yes. you go. <laughs> no, John. What prompted this for us to start looking at extending the thoroughfares to the loop? Well, it's this has been on the, those roads as I showed them have been on the thoroughfare plan for decades. So we we've, we've always had plans to. Uh, continue roadways, we want to ensure the whole purpose of the thoroughfare plan is to ensure an interconnectivity of major roads, arterials, and collectors. And so those have, there's always been plans to extend those roads through. Uh, what brought it up now is there's been some recent discussions with uh, the de owners and developers of the golf course area about moving forward with some of their development plans. And as we were reviewing some of their development plans, we realized that where they've shown roadways, uh, didn't quite match our thoroughfare plan. And so that's really what prompted us to take a look at them now and shift them around. It, again, as you notice on the map, it's largely the same roadways connecting east to west and north to south. We've just shifted the locations a little bit. Can you go back to one of um, the images where you had the, no one, the color coded, that one? So now what streets were you saying we would be looking at taking all the way through to Loop 306? Did you say Roosevelt? Yes, so Roosevelt would be an arterial street and it would come through something like that. Uh, and then Smith Boulevard would be extended as a collector and T down. So those would be the major uh, streets. You would also have Harris continuing through uh, something, like th something like that. Uh, and so that would be a major street, although it doesn't connect all the way through to the loop, it would provide uh, that sort of larger collector street uh, for the area as well. So it would open up Rio Concho Drive, basically, or Roosevelt to Loop 306. So with the housing that's going on, the planned development there, they would be able to take that lower red to the loop or back into um, the downtown area. That's correct. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the um, the golf course folks, uh, you know, have uh, you know property something like that, and so they'll only be responsible when when they start to develop. They'll be responsible for the roads on their property. So, in terms of this arterial, they would build it to something like there, and right. so uh, either the city or. Uh, well, in this case, most of, you know, from, from like here to here is all city property. So the city would be responsible for that section of the road. And that could be done in, in concert with this development, or it could be 10, 20, 30 years, just depending on uh, what, what the city decides in terms of timing of that connectivity. So just because this area develops doesn't necessarily mean that that connectivity will be there immediately. Just as the original one was 30 years old. Correct. And it's not even correct based off of what's out there. So it's the future projected concept, just like the last one was, and hopefully updated based off of the development and future plans that people have. That's right. Um, yes, Tommy, you had, Lane, did you have something? Okay, Tommy, you're next. Uh, silly question on my part. What, what's a parkway, then the green? A parkway is is just another type of roadway, and uh, typically the ones that go through that go through park areas uh, okay. are called a parkway. And there's a, sometimes a little bit different design of how those streets are designed because they go through park areas. Okay, thanks. Lane, John mentioned we would have to acquire a few lots where we would clip. What what would the plan be if we can't acquire those? Well, one answer is we can always acquire. Uh, if we decide to do so, uh, we have uh, power of eminent domain to do that. And uh, although there's controversy over eminent domain, uh, property for a roadway is a perfect example of, of where that's uh, considered. It's privately owned right now. Uh, that's right. Yes. And you can see we looked at some options, which uh, let's say we decide for whatever reason we don't want to take any of that property. 
Uh, we looked at some options. Roosevelt, for example, could swing up and around and avoid that mobile home park. Of course, as you can see, the draw, you can see the blue that comes through there, that creates additional problems. Uh, and that's, you know, we looked at a number of different options of where we could run that roadway. Can you uh, point the park out? That mobile home park is this skinny little Skinny sliver, uh, okay. sliver right there. And so as you can see, uh, to put in that road, we, we wouldn't necessarily have to take the entire property, but it would just be clipping that northern end of it. Could be a nice, a nice asset for the balance of the, of the park too, because they then have a great street or parkway, either way you call it, to get to Loop 306. So it almost becomes a positive for them in terms if they want to hit the loop, because then they don't have to go all the way back up to Pulliam Street or to Loop 306 on the north. Right. And I maybe don't need to say this, but I will just for, for the audience's uh, knowledge. Uh, anytime we would acquire a property like that, we are required to prep pay fair market value for that. So we can't just go out and take people's property without compensating them. I mean, Do I have further questions or comments? One of those things too, over time, that may correct itself, depending on how long correct. the development is out right. there. So it may not ever come into play. That's right. Any other questions, further comment? Do I have a motion for approval? I move to approve. Lucy prepared. moves to approve. Do I have a second? Second. A second by Tommy. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed, motion passes 7-0. We'll move on to item H, consider resolution, English and Spanish calling and ordering the general election for May 2nd, 2020, authorizing the city manager to execute an interlocal agreement for joint election with other parties under the Tom Green County Master Interlocal Agreement and providing for the holding of a joint election to be administrated by the Tom Green County Election Administration. Julia, you're on. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is just a resolution that's required by the state code to call an election within a certain time frame. So we're just calling this for another four-year term for our chief of police office um, as required in the city's code of, um, city charter. <laughs> Any questions for Julia Harry? You do. I just want to make a comment. We this is only going to be for the police chief from the city's perspective this time around. We need to sometime in the future get this aligned with District One, Three, and Five elections, so we don't have an individual election that costs twenty-five or thirty thousand, costs the city twenty-five or thirty thousand. Yes, but you have Tom Green com County commissioners that are on this one as well, right? This one will be with several other schools. We don't yeah. have the exact names. So we could change ours. You're still going to have an election then, but so our, it doesn't. But I guess my, my question is, our portion of that just for this particular one election is still going to be the same, approximately $25,000. Is that correct? That's what we're expecting. Okay. It just depends how many other entities call at the same time for the cost sharing. Was there Tommy? I'm no, just going to move approval. Move for approval by Tommy. A second. second. Um, any public comment? No public comment. We'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Passes 7-0. We will go to item I, the update on sales tax revenue performance by Tina. Good morning, Mayor, Council, Good morning. Mr. Valenzuela. Uh, sales tax for the month of January and compared with the previous month of January last year is up 10.65%. We're currently over our revenue budget by about $730,000. Uh, for your sales tax by industry information, that's the chart that you like to see comparing um, by industry. We've also had a... Uh, Go back on that one a minute, please. Yes, and is Absolutely. this the two com months combined or the single month? This here is just for the month of December for sales tax by industry. We don't have January numbers for that yet. Okay. Okay. But then this next slide is what you had requested for the comparing the Thank combined you. December and January information. You'll see that San Angelo is up 5%. Um, I'll come back to this slide. We also took it a step further and did year-to-date actual, so October through January, and San Angelo would be up 3.2% in that scenario. I think that's important to look at because two people not paying their taxes one month rolls to the next, and it can make it look dramatically different in terms of the state of the economy. Yeah. So I think it's great to look at the average I and agree. get a better overview of the total picture. Yes, Thank there you. can also be audit adjustments and things like that for month to month. Sure. So looking at year to date, that whole four months, it does show a clearer picture of where we are. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
this point, we will move into our closed session, the executive session on the provision of government code Title V, Open Government, Ethics, Subtitle A, Open Government, Chapter 551, Open Meetings, Subchapter D, Exceptions to Requirement that Meetings be Open under the following sections. A, Section 551.071, 2, consult with attorney when the governmental body seeks the advice of its attorney on a matter in which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar of Texas clearly conflicts with this chapter regarding West Texas Water Partnerships. Could we make sure going forward that a sentence has a maximum of 20 words in it? <laughs> and Section B. 551.072 to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property if deliberation in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body in negotiations with a third person regarding the Ford Ranch. And item C, section 551.0712, consult with attorney when the governmental body seeks the advice of its attorney on a matter in which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar of Texas clearly conflicts with this chapter regarding water rights. The meeting is uh, closed um, for closed session at 10.02. Um, thank you for coming, and we'll be back when we have these items dis discussed. Thank you. Coming back to order at 12.33 uh, p.m. At this point, there are no uh, announcements to be made following the executive session. So we will fall, uh, start with um, consideration of approving various board nominations. So we have the following. Animal Shelter Advisory Committee, Jean Murphy, SMD2, to first term ending January 2022. Silver Service Commission, Teresa Special for Mayor, to a fourth term ending January 2023. Design and Historic Review Commission, David Majore, Mayor to a first term ending, September 2021. Fort Concho Museum Board, Lori Barton, SMD3, to a third term. Shirley Spears, SMD4, to a second term. Joyce Lowe, SMD5, to a second term. David Schaller, SMD6, to a second term. And Kathy Keene, SMD6, to a second term, all ending January 2022. Planning Commission, Luke Urich, SMD1, to its first full term. Joe Self, SMD2 to a first full term. Joe Spano, SMD6 to a second term. And Conley Brooks III, Mayor to first full term, all ending January 2022. Zoning Board of Adjustment, Debbie Cunningham, SMD1 to a third term. Jason Fernandez, SMD3 to a first full term. Gary Cortez, Mayor to a first full term. Danny Aguero, Mayor alternate to a first full term, all ending January 2022. Do I have a uh, motion to approve all the above and red appointments? I'll move. A move by Tommy, a second by Harry. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 None opposed. Motion passes 7 six, 0 to all the appointments. And now we are up for announcements and consideration of future agenda items. Are there any from council? With none from council, do I have a motion for adjournment? We adjourn. Any opposed? If none are opposed, we will adjourn this meeting at 12.35 p.m.